Assalamu alaikum students welcome back to class this is your american literature class and um, in the last few classes we've been discussing um, emerson's essay on self reliance uh, we finally finished with it and um, today we're going to start a short story by herman melville if you remember in the introductory lecture i told you that we were going to proceed in a chronological manner it's not really possible to um give you even a bird's eye view of american literature in um the duration of one short uh, course but what i'm trying to do is to expose you to as many different genres of american literature as possible so we had the essay now we move on to short stories you had many short stories um in your prose 2 paper also uh but this short story that we're going to be doing um today onwards is very representative it's one of the most um famous short stories uh in american literature the title is bartleby the scrivener and the writer is uh herman melville now because i said that we're going to be moving chronologically um melville was writing in the 19th century and you will see that there is a difference between his prose or his language and that of later writers this is slightly more formal language particularly when you keep in mind the fact that bartleby um the person around whom this story uh, revolves uh is slightly formal in speech he's not he does not use the casual conversational style um that we would expect in uh, a short story or um in the character of a short story this um story was originally published in 1853 um and um you have to remember when you reading it that this is not the conversational style of the 21st century this is the 19th century it is uh, melville's um signature story and uh, like i said before one of the most famous short stories and bartleby is a very famous character in american literature because of um his manner because of his approach towards life and the attitude that he exhibits um in this story so um the the essay that we have been doing focused on something very different from the short story that we'll be doing today onwards so let us get on with the text you'll see that in this uh, short story we're going to go slightly faster with the slides i do have all of um, the text copied on to powerpoint but uh, because this is short story and um, as such um there are there, there is not the more formal language of the essay therefore i'll be skipping some slides or i'll be combining two or three slides and explaining them together okay so let us start with bartleby the scrivener and see how melville introduces us to this character the story is titled bartleby the scrivener uh, colon a story of wall street and um this is going to be a story about a scrivener so before we start off let me explain to you what a scrivener actually is the root of the word is in scribe and if you remember um there were they have always been scribes for people um important people have not always done their own writing these days of course everyone has a computer everyone has um an ipad or a phone on which you go tick 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 and you write everything down yourself but we are talking about a time when um these uh, formal documents particularly those pertaining to legal matters were prepared by scribes uh, and scribes were um clerks who would write everything down so if anything wanted to be um you wanted to have a copy made of a document it had to be manually written down it's not like today when you give it to the photocopier 
uh, or you put it in the fax machine and out pops a copy. You are talking about a time when you did not have um, the same uh, access to technology that you do now. So a scrivener is basically a scribe or a clerk who copies documents. And um, because in, um, in legal matters there are lots of documents uh, and they have to have multiple copies, therefore a scribe or a scrivener was an essential part of a lawyer's office. So um, you could not really operate a lawyer's office if you did not have a scrivener. So the story is titled Bartleby the Scrivener, a story of Wall Street, which is where all the lawyers um, had their offices. Um, the narrator starts off by saying, I'm a rather elderly man. The nature of my avocations for the last 30 years has brought me into more than ordinary contact with what would seem an interesting and somewhat singular set of men, of whom as yet nothing that I know of has ever been written. So uh, up till the time that um, Melville planned to write this story, he says that this is a, a class of people about him nothing had been written, and that is scribes or scriveners or clerks. Um, you had a, a lot of material about, let's say, kings and queens, or their ministers, or the common people. But this working class, which is a very essential part of the legal fraternity, there has been nothing written about them. So the law copies, or scriveners, that's a group of people about, him, uh, about whom not ha much has been written. Uh, in fact, Melville goes on to say that nothing has been written. And that's the group of uh, people that he is going to focus in um, this particular um, short story. And in particular, one copyist or uh, one scrivener, that is Bartleby. He says, I've known very many of them professionally and privately. And if I were given the time, I could write about them in detail. And I could possibly write about their whole lives. But um, for the, for the um, duration of this story, uh, he's going to be talking about just one particular Scrivener, that is Bartleby. And the interesting thing is that Melville says that I don't know the details of his life. I only know him from the moment that I met him. Uh, what his past life was, I have absolutely no idea. So this is not the kind of um, story in which I can tell of the life of uh, Bartleby. But I'm just going to tell you the story of his life as it was from the moment that I first met him. Uh, and, the re and one of the reasons he's doing um, this for Bartleby is because he says that he was the strangest I ever saw or heard of. While of other law copies I might write the complete life of Bartleby, nothing of that sort can be done. So he knew the other uh, law copies or he knew the other scriveners, but of Bartleby he didn't know anything from the time before um, he actually met him. And according to him, no material exists for a full and complete biography. Um, of course, Melville feels that it's an irreparable loss to literature because um, for him, Bartleby was the most interesting character that he had ever met in that group of people which um, goes by the name of scriveners or law copies. Um, he was one of those beings of whom nothing is ascertainable except from the original sources and in his case those are very small. So there are no original cases uh, except for uh, what he experienced, what he saw and that was of Bartleby as a full grown man. He's not the kind of person about him. Um, about whom the narrator um, knew what his childhood was, was like or where he was born or what his parents were or where he got his um, education, etc. 
So um, he says, before I introduce the scrivener, I have to give a short uh, account of myself, my employees, and um, the office, in fact, in which Bartleby one day entered. So he says that um, my business is that I am a lawyer, but um, I am not the kind of lawyer who goes and fights in the courts uh, and uh, about whom, you know, you see these days um, on television also. In my childhood, we had the young lawyers. Um, there is uh, Boston Legal that is being shown these days, and there are other programs which have been based on um, the workings of uh, lawyers. And um, in order to uh, understand fully uh, the importance of this uh, story and the character of Bartleby, you need to know a little about a law firm, about who comprises a law firm and how does it work. So there are various um, kinds of uh, law that are being practiced. Uh, and uh, one of these is criminal law, uh, where you have people who are accused of, let's say, committing a murder or a kidnapping or uh, perhaps um, stealing some things. And so the case goes to the court, and you have lawyers from both sides uh, attacking and defending and trying to prove their party to be innocent. That's criminal law. What the narrator here says is that this is a profession that is supposed to be very energetic and nervous. But, uh, but there is another side to it also. And um, that is the, the side where unambitious lawyers uh, go. The, the ambitious lawyers go for criminal law. Uh, the unambitious lawyers go for something like, let's say, corporate law, where you deal with paperwork um, all the time, and you look after people's investments, and um, you take care of, uh, let's say, their property documents, etc., etc. So um, the narrator says that I'm one of those ambitious lawyers who has never wanted to address a jury. Again, that's a reference to uh, criminal law. But in the cool tranquility of a snug retreat, do a snug business among rich men's bonds and mortgages and title deeds. So he's mentioned three, um, three categories of documents that he deals with. He deals with bonds or with um, securities or what you would call saving certificates. Uh, and um, he deals with mortgages. That is, when you buy a house on installments, um, you have to pay a certain amount of money as installment every month or every quarter or every year. And you need someone who can take care of that business because you want to make sure that the proper payments are made at the proper time, etc. And title deeds or property that is passed on from one person to another, the buying and selling of property or um, the inheritance of property, etc. So he's not the kind of person who is very ambitious and who wants to be in the limelight. He is content to sit in the background and work with documents only, work only with papers. Um, uh, as he says, I have a snug retreat and a snug business. It's the kind of business that gives you uh, a lot of money, uh, does not involve uh, any danger. It does not involve any risk whatsoever. So um, because uh, he deals with um, legal documents only, so he says that I have a very snug business. And uh, those who know me consider me an eminently safe man. The best thing that you want in a lawyer is one who is safe. I'm not talking about criminal law. I'm talking about law where you need to have documents prepared and where you need to have proof of um, possession uh, established. 
So um, the narrator says that he is a safe man. People go to him, people give him work to do because he can be depended on. Because he's a safe person, he will not take risks and he will not endanger um, the life, uh, sorry, the money and property of his clients. The late John Jacob Astor, a personage little given to poetic enthusiasm, had no um, hesitation in pronouncing my first grand point to be prudence. So one of the finest qualities that he's supposed to have and um, the quality that uh, John Jacob Astor um, admired in him was prudence. Prudence is specifically when you uh, are very careful, when you do not take undue risks, when you are a very safe and trustworthy person, you are said to be prudent. And um, he says that being given this sort of uh, title or description by John Jacob Astor means a lot to me because um, he was not a person uh, or not the kind of person who would pay compliments um, in bulk or who would pay compliments just for the sake of uh, complimenting someone. He was a very careful man himself and if he called anyone careful that just goes to show um, how high in Astor's estimation um, the narrator was. So sometime prior to the period at which this little history begins the avocations had been largely increased that is a greater responsibility had been entrusted um, on to uh, um, the narrator. The good old office, now extinct in the state of New York, of a master in chancery had been conferred upon me. So a master in chancery um, was a kind of um, official uh, designation given to um, a lawyer and um, since that time uh, the narrator says that office has been abolished. But while I had that office, while I had that post, there was a lot of government work that was coming to me. So a master in chancery would have a lot of uh, government legal documents um, to deal with. It wasn't a very difficult job because it was an additional responsibility. It wasn't uh, full-time work, but it was an additional responsibility and uh, while uh, there wasn't a lot of work involved, uh, there was a lot of money involved. And so he says that um, since I was a safe man, since I was very prudent, therefore the government entrusted me with this post and the additional responsibility um, uh, and work that uh, it entailed also meant that I would get more money. Obviously his prestige um, in society also rose because he was given a government um, job. So uh, while on the topic of the master in chancery he says that uh, that post should not have been abolished. It is not um, in my jurisdiction to make comments about that. But I think that uh, the post should have been kept even if I was not working on it. Someone else should have been um, dealing with government documents. So um, he comes on to a description of the premises of his law offices and he says, that uh, my offices or chambers as they call for uh, lawyers and uh, judges. He says my chambers were on Wall Street. At one end they looked upon the white wall of the interior of a spacious skylight shaft penetrating the building from top to bottom. This view might have been considered rather tame than otherwise and deficient in what landscape painters call life. So he's, remember he's in the city. The urban landscape um, is not always beautiful because you're talking about office buildings and uh, in office buildings what is um, looked for is utility. If it is space that you're talking about, 
you would like to um, see how best that space can be utilized. If it is light that you're talking about, then also you, um, you think of uh, what kind of a light is required. And that's the kind of light that you have installed in Office Plus. Um, walls or what you have these days are more cubicles. You know, the kind of offices that you have uh, nowadays in the big cities. You have one big hall and that is separated by semi-partitions. Not total partitions going up to the ceiling, but um, glass or um, wooden partitions which separate that uh, hall or that room into different sections. Nowadays, of course, what you have is every individual being given a computer. So you have a small desk and um, you may or may not have a printer. You might have a printer that is uh, sort of networked and that 10 people are using at the same time. So um, that's very different from the kind of office space that Melville is talking about and which was available in the 19th century uh, for lawyers. Um, even here, you know, if you go and um, towards the district courts or the high courts, you will see that the area around the court, um, you have different offices that are um, set up. Um, and sometimes you don't even have proper office space. Sometimes it is just like uh, a kiosk or what you'd call a khokha. It's just a partition and you have uh, space for two or three people to sit there. So you'd have that kind of um, a space uh, and uh, that's enough because it's very utilitarian. So um, Melville's narrator um, says that because he was given this additional government responsibility, um, he had a proper office and he gives you a description of the office. He says that um, it wasn't a very big office, but it was better than many other uh, people's. So um, his, um, his windows looked out upon walls because this is office uh, space and this is a, an office building. Therefore, you don't have any lawns to look out upon or you don't have any trees to look out upon. You have buildings facing uh, buildings, walls facing walls. So if one building has a window, um, that window will look out over the wall of another um, office, um, perhaps. So, owing to the great height of the surrounding buildings and my chambers being on the second floor, the interval between my wall and the others was like a huge square cistern. You know what a cistern is? Before you had these um, western style toilets that you have now, you had uh, the water tank was at a higher level. If you have seen um, photos of uh, old houses or old bathrooms particularly, you will have noticed that high on the wall is that square uh, box that is a water tank and which many people refer to as a tanky um, in Pakistan and which is actually called a cistern. So he says that because um, these office buildings uh, faced each other, the space between these um, walls of these buildings looked exactly like a water tank the, because it's all square, all angles. So no beauty in it, nothing that you could look out at and say, oh, what a wonderful view there is. So at the period just preceding the advent of Bartleby, I had two persons as copies in my employment and a promising lad as an office boy. So uh, uh, Melville wants to give the description of um, the office because um, the people who are working in the office and the actual physical office space has a very important role to play in this story. So he says there were two copies or two clerks um, the first was turkey, the second was nippers, and then there was this little boy um, who was called ginger nut. 
and um, this boy was what you'd call a runner or a naib kasid or a peon. Um, so he was just there to do the running around uh, while the clerks were busy in their uh, copying and in their writing. So um, Turkey and Nippers, he says, they may seem like names, but they were not because uh, you wouldn't find them in a directory. But these were names by which they were referred to because of their temperaments and personalities. So um, then he goes on to give a description of um, the physical features and the attitude of um, these three uh, characters whom he had in his employment shortly before Bartleby comes onto the scene. So Turkey, he says, was a short, prissy, Percy Englishman of about my own age, that is somewhere not far from 60. So Turkey was not a young man. He was middle-aged, approaching old age, and um, he was short. And uh, what is most important about Turkey is the fact that in the morning he was red-faced, but after 12 o'clock, he says, that his face became redder and redder until you thought that it would explode. And uh, by the time 6 p.m. rolled around, which was the time when they finished off work, um, his face was as red as red can be. So um, until lunchtime, he was okay. He worked fine. But after lunchtime, his face became redder and redder, and it was not just his face. Um, his whole uh, attitude, his whole approach towards life changed. So the redder he became, the angrier he became, um, and his temper shortened after 12 o'clock until towards 6 o'clock you felt that he was going to explode because he got angry at the slightest provocation. And, he's, uh, and the narrator says, there are many coincidences I have known in the course of my life um, when um, Turkey displayed his fullest beams from his red and radiant countenance and at the critical period when um, he, when the narrator thought that um, he could not do any work, Turkey would still go and deliver. And, um, and, but after 12 o'clock, it was very difficult to make him work uh, because he would become angry at the slightest thing that was said to him. So the narrator said that it's not that he didn't do any work. He was perfect until 12 o'clock. Um, and he uh, did a lot of work and he did it quickly and he did it to my satisfaction. But somehow something happened to him at 12 o'clock um, and he would just sort of uh, become angry uh, at the slightest things that were said to him. But until 12 o'clock he was safe. So um, he says all his blots upon my documents were dropped there after 12 o'clock meridian. So uh, again, um, I want to compare the situation of clerks today with the clerks in the 19th century for the simple reason that, um, as I said before, technology has made a lot of difference. Uh, and what clerks don't have to do nowadays is to write everything by hand. Uh, we still have some documents uh, where the clerk or the, the scrivener will write something with his pen or with his column. If you have seen what are called uh, stamped pa stamp papers or stam as we call them, uh, you will see that there might be everything computer typed on the paper, but at the back you will still see some handwriting being done. And um, that is evidence that that document has been prepared by a scribe or uh, by what Melville calls a scrivener. 
So when these um, scribes are preparing uh, these documents, um, because they're writing um, with pens and special pens, sometimes um, there would be ink blots on the document. And then you would have to use uh, sometimes sand for the ink or you would nowadays use an eraser um, or you would use Blanco. But whenever there was a blot on that document, uh, you would have to clean that up. If you did not clean the blot, then you would need to write that document again. And because it was done with uh, by, by hand, um, it involved a lot of labor and a lot of time. So all the blots that were made on the documents by Turkey were done after 12 o'clock when he became really, really short-tempered and um, he became angry very quickly. So um, some days, of course, it was just that he was blotting the documents or throwing things around. And then other days he became rather noisy and because his face was getting redder and redder, um, it made him even more angry. And he would, you know, bang things and bang doors uh, and generally be um, very, very upset and very, very uh, irritable. Not a comfortable person to have around. Okay. So because he was um, a very um, hardworking man uh, and therefore very valuable, the narrator had to put up with the vagaries of his nature. You know, he couldn't really kick him out because uh, he wasn't doing any work after 12 o'clock or his, uh, he was doing bad work after 12 o'clock. Because before 12 o'clock, he was perfect. He would copy whatever you gave him. Um, he would write down a lot of things. He would run around, etc., etc. And, um, and do everything in record time. Um, so um, the narrator had to overlook certain eccentricities. He calls them eccentricities. And then he also calls him a turkey because um, like a turkey, he becomes all red in the face. Um, so um, because uh, he did very good work in the morning, so um, the narrator made sure that whatever work was given to him, uh, the maximum amount was given to him in the morning so that he would complete it before 12 o'clock and when his, uh, as we say, meter ghoom jata, you know, when we talk about, we make jokes about, uh, let's say, pakhtuns or we make jokes about six and we say that, you know, after 12 o'clock, something goes wrong with them and they lose control of their senses. So that kind of a situation you have here with Turkey, except that Turkey is an Englishman. Uh, and he's working in a lawyer's office where everything is very organized and very planned. So one Saturday afternoon, he says, uh, because he was always worse on Saturdays, I tried to hint to him that he was growing old and um, he might want to, let's say, start working part-time instead of uh, working full time uh, and in short work until 12 o'clock which is at the time that he uh, works perfectly uh, and um, so he so, so the narrator um, sort of gave him a suggestion that now that he was getting old um, he might want to go part time and work only until 12 o'clock which was the safe time and after 12 o'clock he could just go home and he said no I am going to stay here. And uh, when the idea sort of uh, sank into his mind, he became even more upset and he became angry. Uh, and he just picked up this long ruler and with that ruler he started sort of uh, making gestures. And uh, finally he asked the narrator that if his services were required in the morning, how is it that in the afternoon they would be able to de do without him? Um, and you have to remember that the language that they use is very formal because they're working in an environment where formal language is used, where um, official or legal language is used. 
Therefore, even in their ordinary conversations, you see that formality of language coming in. So Turkey starts everything uh, or every sentence with uh, the, the phrase, with submission, sir. I consider myself your right hand man. In the morning, I but marshal and deploy my columns. But in the afternoon, I put myself at their head and gallantly charge the foe. Thus, so he has this ruler in his hand and it's almost like he's going to attack the narrator. And he says, you know, in the morning, I make preparations. And um, the, the metaphor that he uses is from the army. And he says that I arrange all my work in the morning. It's in the afternoon that I do the actual copying. As he says, I deploy my columns. I put out all my work on my desk. And in the afternoon, I start writing. And I write furiously. Um, so when <laughs> the narrator says, but you know, after 12 o'clock, you make ink blots. And he says, yes, I make ink blots, but look at me, look at this hair, I'm getting old. And if at this age I make a blot or two on a document, it's not something um, that is uh, punishable. And then <laughs> he makes that remark, which really gets to the narrator, and he says, uh, with submission, sir, or with due respect, as we say, we are both getting old. So he, he sort of um, hits out at the narrator by saying, because remember the narrator had said that Turkey is of his age. So he says, I'm not the only one who's getting old. You're getting old also. Why don't you stop half your work? You should also take a half day, not work full time. So um, this appeal or this um, last thrust that Turkey made, um, was something that the narrator could not argue with. And um, he says that, you know, I decided that I would let him stay uh, and uh, try to give him the maximum amount of work in the morning and in the afternoon to avoid giving him any work because he didn't like to have people um, upset around him. Okay, so much for Turkey. The second character he says is Nippers and Nippers was a whiskered sallow and rather piratical looking young man of about 5 and 20 so where Turkey is um, reaching retirement age Nippers is very young and that is one reason uh, why uh, Melville has given him this name um, and the narrator says I always deemed him the victim of two evil powers, ambition and indigestion. The ambition was evinced by a certain impatience of the duties of a mere copyist. You know, he thought, I, th these are beyond me. Th these are things that are beneath me. I need to work on higher things. So he always thought that his job as copyist was um, beneath his dignity, but for want of a better job, um, he was doing it. So um, he was ambitious and he was out to make his way in the world. You also have to remember that he's only 25. So at 25, if you become a clerk or if you become um, a, a, a law um, a, belonging to the legal fraternity, then um, you have to be um, very careful and you have to plan everything very nicely. Uh, and um, Melville says that there were two problems um, with Nippers. One was that he was very ambitious and the other was his bad digestion. So, um, you know, um, when somebody has bad uh, digestion, it affects their entire personality. It's not just that your stomach is not working properly or you have an upset stomach or you're constipated. It affects your entire attitude towards life. And one of the things that uh, Melville points out about nippers is that uh, somehow nippers could not get his table to suit him. He tried putting things under the table to raise the surface of the table. 
then the table would become too high for him. He tried to put it on a slant because, you know, they had to bend over. So the desks that they um, used to have in the 19th century were the kind that were sloping. And uh, Nipper somehow could not get a desk to suit him. He tried putting paper under the, the, the table legs. He tried putting other things. He tried to raise the surface of the table. He tried to lower it. Somehow or the other, he could not get his table to be the way he wanted it. And so he would constantly be trying to do something to the level of um, the table. But no invention would answer. If for the sake of easing his back, he brought the, the, the table lid at a sharp angle well up towards his chin and wrote there like a man using the steep roof of a Dutch house for his desk, then he declared that it stopped the circulation in his arms. So what he would be doing is that he would be uh, writing on a table that came up to here. And he would have to slow, he would have to bend over. Now when he did that, uh, it, it hurt his arms. So um, then what he did was, he lowered the level of the table. And when he did that, um, he had to bend over even more. And that, he says, gave him a backache. So Nippers had this constant problem of not being able to adjust his table to his liking. What he wanted at one minute was very different from what he wanted in another minute. And that was why um, he could not get his um, table level or table direction um, to suit him. Among the manifestations of his diseased ambition was a fondness he had for receiving visits from certain ambiguous looking fellows in CD courts whom he called his clients. Now Nippers is, um, is a typical uh, clerk uh, in the sense that he is running a side business. Um, he says that he gets uh, a lot of clients. You know, he fancies that he is also a lawyer uh, and that he has clients. So he doesn't give the impression that he is just a clerk um, in the employment of another um, qualified lawyer. But um, he pretends that he is the lawyer and that he has clerks also. Uh, he has clients who come to him. So um, because Melville has told us already that Nippers was very ambitious and he thought that, you know, just being a clerk was um, no job uh, and that he do needed to do something more. So he went around um, looking for people uh, who wanted a little... Uh, easy business uh, done and they would pay uh, nippers they would not come to uh, the narrator they would not come to the lawyer but they would go to the clerk even in your own courts you will see that if you go towards the courts you see people who are just sort of wandering around and um, if they see you entering the premises, they will at once come to you and say, do you want a document prepared? Do you want, uh, let's say, a lease deed prepared, what is called a kraya nama? Do you want to transfer property? Can I help you? Now, those are the kind of people whom we call touts and uh, who are actually scriveners. These are the clerks of the lawyers. So these clerks go around looking for business. And um, then they bring those uh, clients to the lawyer's office. Now the difference here is that these clients are not coming to the narrator. These clients are coming to the clerk, the scrivener, the scribe, um, to Nippers. And Nippers was making a, a little money on the side. But he would always say that they were, cli they were clients. Although um, the kind of people who came to see him did not really look like clients who could pay the fee of a lawyer. These were people who wanted something done um, in um, the minimum amount of uh, money. 
So, um, the, the narrator says that I know that Nippers was doing a little business on the side, but as long as he completed the work that I gave to him, it didn't really matter to me if he was doing another job or if he was running a side business. So, um, with all his failings and all his annoyances um, that he caused the narrator, Nippers, like his compatriot at Turkey, was a very useful man to me. So, he did his work. It wasn't that he uh, shirked the work that he had to do with the lawyer. He did all his work. It's in his free time that he did this other business on the side with uh, with maybe um, race bookies or uh, people who were going to gamble or something like that. Uh, plus the fact that he always dressed in a gentlemanly sort of way and so incidentally reflected credit upon my chamber. So because he was so well dressed, um, people had a very good feeling when they came to the office and he was very polite with them and um, very courteous with them. So because he was well dressed, people who came to the office were very favorably um, impressed. And um, Nippers and Turkey were, um, were in sort of contradiction um, with each other, were so different from each other um, that uh, Melville says, that even in appearance, there was the world of a difference between Nippers and Turkey. Nippers was very, very proper, uh, very well dressed, whereas Turkey was um, was an embarrassment to have. And there were times when the narrator says, "I had to tell Turkey to um, dress better," but he never did. You know, he would stick to the costume that he had made for himself and never pay uh, any attention to, um, to his clothes. So uh, the narrator had to argue with um, Turkey for a lot of his uh, things and that included his appearance or uh, his clothes. Um, but uh, when the narrator asks um, Turkey what he does with his money, he does not get a response. And uh, it's Nippers who says that uh, all that Turkey o earns goes to buy red ink because um, that is what he is most concerned with. Now, one fine day, the narrator seeing that Turkey was not really properly dressed uh, for the winter or um, for, um, for, for the office, he brought out a padded gray coat, beautiful coat, uh, but which was uh, slightly used. And um, he, he, he gave that to Turkey just as a hint that that's the kind of uh, clothes uh, Turkey should be wearing. But this coat had a, the, the adverse effect on, uh, on nippers. And the example that Melville quotes is that of a horse that has had uh, too much oats. He says, just as too much oats is bad for, um, for a horse, Therefore, this coat that I gave you, it was very soft and it was of very rich fabric. So it sort of uh, became something that uh, Nippers could not really um, digest. Indeed, nature herself seemed to have been his vintner and at his birth charged him so thoroughly with an irritable brandy-like disposition that all subsequent potations were needless. So any attempt that any human being could make to make Nippers see sense was futile because Nippers only did what he wanted to. 
Turkey dressed yeah. in the way that he wanted to and if you gave Turkey the present of something like a coat, Turkey would not like that at all and um, he would not take kindly to such and such uh, an offer. Uh, so, he's, so the narrator says, when I consider how amid the stillness of my chambers, Nippers would some, sometimes impatiently rise from his seat and stooping over his table, spread his arms wide apart, seize the whole desk and move it and jerk it with a grim grinding motion on the floor as if the table were a perverse voluntary agent intent on thwarting and vexing him. I plainly perceive that for nippers, brandy and water were altogether superfluous. So he tried telling him that he should not drink brandy and that if he did, he should dilute it with water. But he says that um, just to see nippers sometimes picking up his table and moving it around on the floor uh, of the office, the narrator feels that nothing could have any effect on him. Whatever you did to him, however you talked to him, there was no change in his behavior. There was absolutely no, no change in his um, attitude towards his work or towards his uh, office space. It was fortunate for me that owing to its pe peculiar, okay, it was fortunate for me that owing to its peculiar cause, indigestion, the irritability and consequent nervousness of nippers were mainly observable in the morning, while in the afternoon he was comparatively mild. So the kind of situation you have here is very strange. Turkey's paroxysms come only after 12 o'clock. He did not have to worry about turkey during the morning. Nippers um, was irritable in the morning and he was perfectly all right after 12 o'clock. So the two sort of balanced each other um, and uh, what the narrator calls fits. He says that when nippers fit was on, Turkey's was off and vice versa. When Turkey's was on, Nippers was off. So this was a good natural arrangement under the circumstances. Then the third person in his office is Ginger Nut, the small boy who is about 12 years old. And you know it was again um, a sort of tradition to have very young boys working in the office of a lawyer so that uh, in the running around that uh, he was made to do, he would uh, learn from the, from the lawyer and the clerk and he would also make contacts and later on could study to be a clerk. So Ginger Nut is the third person in the office his father was a car man um, or a mechanic, uh, a car mechanic, but he was ambitious. He wanted his son to be doing something better than um, what a car mechanic uh, does. He didn't want him sitting on a cart. He wanted him to sit on a bench. In other words, he wanted him um, to study, to get education and not to have to do manual work. So he sent uh, Ginger Nut as a student to his office um, at the rate of one dollar a week. So he was doing the cleaning, the sweeping um, and he was generally running around um, trying to do whatever errands they wanted. If they wanted him to get something, if they wanted him to uh, take something to some other person, they would use uh, ginger nut. Uh, he had a little desk to himself, but he did not use it much because ginger nut was not doing any of the writing and a desk was needed only for those people uh, who were doing um, the, the, the writing. Uh, and of course, when you examine the desk, 
you found what was uh, interesting Jenjanat. Remember, he's only 12 years old. So he had a great array of shells of uh, various kinds of nuts. Indeed, to this quick-witted youth, the whole noble science of the law was contained in a nutshell. And here Melville is playing upon um, the word nutshell. And that is um, what gives him his name. He says, not the least among the employments of Ginger Nut, um, as well as one which he discharged with the most uh, alacrity, was his duty as cake and apple purveyor for Turkey and Nippers. So he was being used mostly by Turkey and Nippers. And um, because uh, what they could uh, what they could eat and what they liked and what they could afford was um, cake and nuts. So that's what um, the um, w that's what the two clerks would use ginger nut for. Uh, one would send him out to give get one thing, and uh, the other would then send him for something else. So copying law papers being proverb proverbially a dry, husky sort of business, my two scriveners were fain to moisten their mouths very often with Spitzenbergs to be had at the numerous stalls near the custom house and post office. They also sent ginger nut very frequently for that particular cake, that is, a small, flat, round, and very spicy cake, um, which is called a ginger nut. <laughs> so because he was buying ginger nuts all the time, so Turkey and Nippers ended up by calling him the, the ginger nut boy or ginger nut. Of a cold morning when business was but dull, Turkey would gobble up scores of these cakes as if they were mere wafers. So they were very small. They're like what you call biscuits. Um, and uh, turkey and nippers ate a lot of them. And of course, when there was uh, little work to be done, and it was very cold, they would send him out again and again uh, to get ginger nuts. And uh, that's what they were consuming um, the whole day. Of all the fiery afternoon blunders and flurried rashnesses of turkey, was his once moistening a ginger, ginger cake between his lips and clapping it onto a mortgage for a seal. Now, the extent to which they, um, these ginger cakes are on their minds uh, is, is shown by the narrative. And he says, you know, one of the silliest things that Turkey once did because um, he was at a time when his fit was on, uh, he, he, he licked a ginger cake and instead of using the regular uh, wax um, for, for as a seal, he just uh, licked that ginger nut and he used that ginger nut as uh, a seal on a legal document. And the narrator says, I came within an ace of dismissing him then. He was so angry. You know, this is not the kind of thing you use. You have all this legal paraphernalia around you, and you use a ginger cake as a seal. But um, you have to see um, the way in which um, Turkey operates. You know, instead of feeling guilty, he says, with submission, sir, it was generous of me to find you in stationery on my own account. So what he's trying to say is, you know, I haven't done anything wrong. What I have done is, um, is what any sane, sensible person would do. I have used my own stationery. So he's calling that ginger cake a piece of stationery. And he says, I've used my own stationery. I've used my own money for your work. So the way that he puts it, uh, starting all his sentences with, uh, with, with submission, sir, takes away the rudeness um, that you would find in a clerk saying this to his boss or to his um, employer. So he says his original business that of a conveyancer and title hunter and drawer up of recondite documents of all sides 
was considerably increased by receiving the master's office. And here you have a slight shift um, in uh, the story that um, uh, that, that uh, Melville is narrating. And um, he says that when I was given the office of uh, master in chancery, my work increased because there were all these other legal documents that were also coming to his office and of course there was a lot of work for the scriveners for uh, the scribes and he had to push uh, the clerks who were already with him um, and he also needed help he needed a third clerk so he advertised and uh, one fine morning, there is this young man standing on uh, the office threshold. Um, and Melville says, I can see that figure even now, pallidly neat, pitiably respectable, incurably forlorn. So there's this thin, pale young man standing at his doorstep and this was Bartleby this is the person around whom this whole story revolves so he is questioned for his qualifications and um, at once um, the narrator engages him as a clerk because he's already told us that when he got this additional government assignment his work increased and he uh, could no more do all his work with two clerks. He needed another one. So um, Bartleby was engaged and the narrator says that he is the most um, sedate young man that I have ever had in my employment. Now you have to contrast him, compare him with Turkey and Nippers. Nippers who's always dragging his desk around, who's trying to raise the level of his desk, then lower the level of his desk, and Turkey who is making all those ink blots in the afternoon, and who is shouting and who is throwing things around. So having Bartleby in the office was a very big plus point was uh, was something that um, that uh, that that was very um, sort of uh, beneficial to the office atmosphere because he not only gave a tone of um, respectability but he also um, sort of toned down the atmosphere in the office because um, Turkey and Nippers uh, one or the other was always in an angry mood. I should have stated before that ground glass folding doors divided my premises into two parts. So um, Melville gives a further description of the physical um, space of uh, his office and um, he says that um, my, the office that I occupied was divided into two um, by this um, folding door which separated my area from that of the clerk's area. And uh, depending on the, the, the weather, depending on uh, his own inclination, his own mood, he would close these doors or open them. Um, there was no sort of set rule as to whether those doors were to stay open or shut all the time. But he says, I resolved to assign Bartleby a corner by the folding doors, but in my side of the office space, not the office space of the Scriveners. And one reason that he did this was um, that he thought that Bartleby would be uh, more easily accessible if there was something that he wanted done in an urgency and it took the clerks some time to get up from their seats and come to um, the, the, the lawyer's office. So he said, I gave Bartleby a desk uh, in my side of um, the office space 
and there was this small side window um, at, at, in his part of um, the office. And uh, this window, like the other windows, did not look out upon lawns or gardens or beautiful trees, but it looked upon a brick wall. The only thing was it gave some light. It was faced uh, on the other side by another office building, but it looked out upon um, the building and therefore it got some sunlight. Within three feet of the panes was a wall and the light came down from far above. So because um, his office is on the second floor and um, these are buildings that are multi-storied so um, he gets a little uh, light uh, and that is enough for him. Still further to a satisfactory arrangement I procured a high green folding screen which might entirely isolate Bartleby from my sight but not remove him from my voice. So he made a kind of um, cubicle for Bartleby with the help of um, this high green folding screen so that Bartleby had his own office space but um, he could still be called out to assist in anything um, in which his help was uh, required. And um, the, um, the, the impact that Bartleby had on the office is what Melville is going to be discussing next. Uh, but before he does that, he says that Bartleby did a lot of copying. You know, he did a, a whole lot of writing. And um, it was almost as if um, he ate those documents. It was almost as if he consumed those documents because the more work I gave him, the, the, the speedier he uh, dealt with it. So he was working very fast and he was working very studiously and um, with a lot of efficiency. And he did not even stop for meals. The others, you know, they had a different kind of personality after they had had their their lunch or dinner as um, they refer to it uh, and if you gave him uh, uh, and Bartleby was different from those people he didn't seem to eat anything he didn't seem to need a break if you gave him work he would not rest until uh, that work was finished and um, if he had to do it early morning he would do it if he had to do it late night he would do it he wasn't like the others who came at a particular time and left at a particular time. Um, I, I think that's all that we're going to do today. Let me quickly go back over uh, what we have done. And the rest of the story we can do in, uh, in, in a later lecture. So um, we started off with uh, Herman Melville's Bartleby the Scrivener. And... Um, I told you that this is a story that was uh, published in the middle of the 19th century and um, Melville who was writing, who was, who was definitely 19th century, he wrote um, a lot, he, he's written novels, he's written short stories and Bartleby the Scrivener is one of the most famous and the, the character of Bartleby is one of the most famous in American literature. Uh, this, the story revolves around uh, Bartleby the Scrivener, but the portion that we covered today focuses on uh, a description of um, the narrator's uh, office premises, a description of his position in society, uh, and that is of a lawyer. Um, and um, a description is also given of um, the the people who inhabit that office uh, and uh, the narrator says that uh, before the time that Bartleby came to the office there were two clerks who were working for me and one office boy or PN or runner uh, or messenger boy you can call him whatever you like um, <clears throat> the two uh, clerks are very very important to 
a lawyer's office and um, if you uh, take out the technology that we are using these days you will see that lawyers even now needs what they call scribes or clerks and these scribes or scriveners or clerks were people who were doing all the writing all those legal documents that had to be copied um, these scribes had to do it uh, since everything was written by hand and uh, the computer had not been invented in the 19th century so these scribes were an essential part of a lawyer's office so the narrator had these two scribes by the name of Turkey and Nippers and um, he gives a physical description of Turkey and Nippers at the same time pointing out the difference in their um, in their mental outlook in their temperament um, by saying that Turkey was uh, uh, was a man who worked wonderfully well until 12 noon and after noon um, when he had had his lunch he became redder in face and he became uh, very very short tempered so that he would uh, throw things around and he would bang doors um, and generally nothing seemed to satisfy him on the other hand nippers had a foul uh, temperament in the morning and he would try to um, to make as much of uh, trouble in the morning as possible and one of the things that Melville points out too is that Nippers never seemed to be satisfied with his desk and so he was always moving it around some days he would want to raise the level of the desk other days he would want to lower the level of the desk and then he would turn it around and he would just sort of um, pick up the whole desk and try to move it to another uh, place in the office but because these were solid wooden desks it wasn't very easy to to move them and so when Nippers was doing this it was almost as if he was physically wrestling with the desk and it was like the desk was an adversary an enemy uh, whom he was uh, fighting and um, he could never bring it to the proper level if he raised it high and brought it under his chin um, he had to um, he had to bend over in such a way that his arms hurt if he lowered the level of the desk then he had to lean over even more and that hurt his back so there was always this um, sort of wrestling match going on in the office between nippers and uh, his desk so these are the two clerks that he has in his office the third person is ginger nut and uh, Melville says that these people do not have th these are not their original names these are names that were given to them because of the personalities that um, that were evident um, from their behavior so Turkey who was about 60 years old um, was named after a turkey because he was always red in the face and he got redder and redder after uh, after noon and on the other hand nippers uh, had a bad temper in the morning and was uh, very sedate and very uh, well behaved after noon um, the difference was that nippers was also doing a little business on the side and um, there were always these people very poorly dressed who would uh, come to the office and ask for nippers and be always closeted with him whispering 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 something and uh, nippers because he was very ambitious and he didn't want to be a clerk but wanted to be a lawyer um, he always said that these were clients that he were bringing to the office but these were people with whom he was doing a little business on the side ginger nut the the little lad uh, was the son of a car mechanic and this mechanic thought that he would make his 
uh, son into an educated person and therefore had sent him to the lawyer's office so that in the running around that he was doing as messenger boy, he would also pick up uh, knowledge of the law and knowledge of um, the duties of uh, a scrivener. Now, uh, what happened was that um, the, uh, the lawyer or the narrator was given an additional assignment by the government and this meant that um, he would have to uh, do more work. It wasn't very difficult work, but it was more work and it did mean greater responsibility and more money. So um, he advertised for a lawyer and one fine morning he sees this young man starting on the office threshold and his name was Bartleby. We're going to end here. Uh, we'll do some more in the next lecture. So thank you for being patient with me and Allah Hafiz.